This is the Editor's Half Hour. Step into the life of an editor for 30 minutes as we discuss the craft of editing, industry trends, and editorial resources. Your host is co-founder and CEO of Peak Publishing, Inc., Nadia Jaja Pupa. She is experienced in all facets of the publishing industry, from editing to design, and works with corporate clients and self-published authors. Nadia and her guests are about to share powerful insights and stories on what it takes to be an editor. And this is your host, Nadia Jaja Pupa. Welcome listeners to the Editor's Half Hour. Today we are talking about posthumous editing. This is a topic that is highly relevant, but just not talked about very much. It's such an interesting topic. Uh, Today we're specifically focusing on posthumous editing related to family, relatives. Um, But I know that editors are doing this. I know that they are doing it for public figures. Uh, But today we're talking uh, with Dan Letchworth, and he has an awesome story to share. In fact, he's written written two books, his grandfather's and his father's. And we're going to get into that today. I can't wait. I want to, I don't even want to waste time, but really quick, I'd like listeners to understand how I even got into this. I've never done posthumous editing. Um, I, a colleague of mine is actually doing it right now for um, friends or extended relatives and the conversation was really interesting. And then when I met Dan, which I want to say we met on Twitter when it was still called Twitter, uh, I put out a tweet and uh, I was saying, I'm looking for somebody to interview on my podcast who has done posthumous editing. And Dan reached out. And then I looked at his name and I realized I had attended a program meeting that Dan led for the San Diego Professional Editors Network. And I thought, oh my gosh, what a small world. And it was so cool. Dan is also super cool because he has the coolest background. I swear, uh, the things that you've worked on, uh, with the San Diego magazine, the, the young adult books that you've done are they're high profile things. And it's super, super cool. So in my eyes, Dan is a celebrity. All of my guests are celebrities in my eyes, You're too kind. Uh, but I, <laughs> I want to welcome you, Dan. And I want to thank you for this interview. Um, but please introduce yourself and tell our listeners uh, what you do. Uh, well, hi, my name is Dan Letchworth. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. And thank you for having me on the podcast, Nadia. Yeah. Um, I'm currently a uh, in corporate communications for Illumina, which is a, a, a genome sequencing company here in San Diego. But before that, I was uh, copy chief of San Diego Magazine. And for many years uh, during that time and before that, I copy edited uh, young adult books for Scholastic, uh, Penguin Random House, and a Little Brown Young Readers. So, uh, yeah, and I, I have a self-publishing company called Desert Owl Press, uh, which is up to five books now. That's awesome. I want our listeners to visit your website, desertowlpress.com. I'll be sure to put that in the show notes too, uh, so that they could look at all the other things that you've worked on. It's, it's, fa- it's just fabulous. Um, so let's get into it. So we ha- we're going to talk today about two books specifically uh, that got you into this posthumous editing uh, project. Both of them are two projects. Mm-hmm. The first was, uh, I think this was the first, that's called Now This Ain't No Shit, uh, and that's about a U.S. <laughs> Navy. There we go. U.S. <laughs> Navy uh, rescue pilot memoir. I think that's your grandfather's. Is that right? This, your one's, grandfather's this story? one's my dad's. Oh, uh, that's your dad's story. Okay. Yeah. And then your grandfather's story is we flew out and walked back. And that's the World War II uh, memoir in letters. Mm -hmm. Um, And so let's start. Well, we can we're going to probably jump back and forth. And thank you for pulling those up. I'm going to have links to everything um, if you're listening to the podcast and not watching. Uh, So we're we're probably going to jump back and forth talking about both books in this interview, um, uh, because I know there will be there's different nuances to each book. You know, it's not just a straight up process. So speaking of, do you feel that both books had the same challenges or did each come with its own set of challenges that you had to work through? I feel like uh, the answer to that question is going to be unique to to the author, to the editor. Um, Each of these was certainly unique. Um, Just to give a, a quick overview of each one, we flew out and walked back, subtitle, Letters from a California Boy Who Escaped Nazi-Occupied Italy. Uh, This is a memoir in letters, as you said. Uh, Mm -hmm. My grandpa, his first summer out of high school, he went to a 
first summer job for a few months, but then right after that, he enlisted uh, into the, what was at that time, the Army Air Forces. And for the next two years, he trained to be a bombardier. And he got sent over to Europe uh, flying a B-24 Liberator. And he was shot down over Axis-controlled Yugoslavia. He, wow. But uh, for the, his entire time in the service, he would write letters back home to his parents, one or two letters a week. So hundreds of letters that uh, my family held on to for all these years. And, um, and even during the time, so when I grew up, that was one of the, one of the family stories that we heard, uh, around dinner table, you know, in bits and pieces over the years was, was specifically his time alone behind enemy lines, trying to find, you know, allied soldiers to help him get rescued and, and get back home. So for those 40 days that he was, uh, marooned out there, uh, in Nazi territory, his parents didn't know what was happening. They got a telegram saying, you know, if we hear any news about your, your son, we'll let you know. It's a, it's, it's such an amazing, it's an amazing story because there's so much that you can share. And it's such a, it's such a, um, deeply, uh, emotional journey as well. So, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's, it's such a great, um, tribute. I think, and almost a legacy too for your entire family. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you asked about what challenges came with that book. Um, for this one, um, I think the most challenging part was piecing together the story of what happened while he was uh, alone and, and shot down because he didn't have letters that he wrote at the time about that. You know, those would have to pass all kinds of censors if he were to write about them in detail. His letters just say, okay, I'm all, I'm all safe now. Don't worry. But uh, we were lucky enough to, when he was much older, he uh, he gave a presentation on two different occasions telling that story. And so I had those recordings. I was able to synthesize, you know, picking out, you know, resolving details that didn't quite agree to put together an account of, you know, okay, from the moment that his plane went down to when he was rescued, what happened? Where did he go? Who did he meet? And uh, so it's a, it's a combination of his first person letters and also uh, that kind of synthesized account of as soon as the letters stopped, then what happened? Yeah. And did you grow up very close to your grandfather as well? Was he very much a part of your life? I did. He was just 10 minutes up the road. And uh, yeah. That's awesome. I love that. I know my, it's funny because my grandparents also lived uh, just right down the road from us growing up. Uh, so that's cool. Um, so after he passed away, um, how soon did you begin working on the book? I mean, maybe you can explain for listeners, did because he started, he wanted to write this book, or was it that you created this after? In in Grandpa's case, no. And I should I say his name, uh, Robert Dennison. Uh, in, Robert Dennison. in Grandpa okay. Bobby's case, no. Uh, well, I didn't even know that these letters existed until uh, three years after he died. Um, they were just, wow. I was so lucky, um, that my mom found them in a scrapbook, uh, in his stuff, um, after we were, you That's know, amazing. going through what was remained of his house. So, yeah. yeah, I, I do wish sometimes that I, that, uh, I could have started the project while he was still around. So I could just ask him questions, you know, clarify some details like, okay, so this detail disagrees with that one. What, what actually happened? Uh, unfortunately, yeah. all I had to go on was, you know, there were some other sources about his bomb group in particular that I could look up. Um, and sometimes I just had to make my best guess for whatever sounded good. Yeah, I'm sure. And, and so how did this idea come about? Was this something that a family member approached you or you came up with this idea that you wanted to create a book? It, this one actually started as a feature article for San Diego magazine for, uh, it was a veterans day feature. Uh, and that okay. was before I knew that the letters existed. It was just that story of, uh, of him being shot down and, and being recovered to, uh, allied territory. And it was only after I published that story in, uh, it was the November, 2020, uh, issue of San Diego magazine that my okay. mom was like, Oh, I have all these letters. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? H hundreds. And I, I don't think she even realized neither of us realized because they were all, you know, still in their envelopes, just how wow. many letters and how many thousands of words he had written about everything before that, all of his experience training and, and meeting his crew. Wow. Yeah. It's a true treasure trove of letters. I mean, 
how amazing. In fact, yeah. I did see that article and I know that you have that on your website. Is that right? The San Diego magazine yeah. article? You can, you can, it's, Great. it's a much shortened abbreviated version, uh, the magazine okay. article it's, it's expanded in the book, but yeah, you can read that as a, as a preview of the book, if you like on desertalpress.com. Very, very cool. So the, the, the book on your dad is a different story. So yeah. this wasn't, yeah, that's, that's yeah. not, this was a thing where your dad actually was writing a book. Um, and it was close to when he passed away. Is that right? That's right. So my dad, uh, was in the U S Navy for 21 years. He was a, a helicopter pilot, uh, for pretty much all of that time. He flew the H 46 C night helicopter, which was a, a cargo transfer, cargo transfer, helicopter and a search and rescue vessel. Um, and yeah, he, uh, he died of lung cancer in 2019 and five months before he died, he started writing this book. He's like, wow. I got to get this stuff down because by the time he retired, he was uh, a subject matter expert in the H-46. He had, a, he had achieved every qualification in it. So he knew this helicopter Amazing. like the back of his hand. And, uh, Going back to your first question about the challenges, this was, yeah. you know, God bless my dad, but uh, <laughs> he was not what you would say a, a straightforward storyteller. <laughs> the document from his computer, there were no paragraph breaks at all. It was just <laughs> one wall of text <laughs> with bold and highlight and italic and bullet points. I'm like, oh my gosh, dad. And he would just liberally cut and paste from Wikipedia where he wanted to no. talk more about a specific engine or a specific okay. you know, rotor system. Like, okay, I've got to make sure we're not plagiarizing. And <laughs> he also just cut and pasted images of the different helicopters that he flew and the different planes that he flew yeah. uh, randomly into the document that, you know, Microsoft Word upsets everything. So, oh, of course, it's probably crashing yeah. <laughs> multiple times. <laughs> So yeah, I, I couldn't even start working on turning this uh, Word document into a finished book for some years uh, after he died because it was just too difficult to to really get in there and to get into his uh, his um, what do you call mind space brain space yeah, um, yeah. mindset. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you know the first part was just making sense of all of these notes and 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 everything. Right. Right. And it kind of leads me into thinking about the fact that you're not, obviously you're not a robot. I mean, there's a grieving process involved when a family yes. member passes away. Um, and so it, by the time you started it, uh, I mean, you said it was a couple years. So, um, did you have moments where, you know, it's rehashing your memories? I mean, it was, did you, have to handle that grieving process again? Did things get too emotional? I mean, I feel like in my mind, I feel like it's an obvious answer, but um, I'm curious to hear how you handled that. And if you, if it really caused pauses in the process for you. It's a very good question. And uh, it didn't come up very much with my grandpa's book because most of them were contemporary letters from when he was 19 years old, way back in 1944. Mm -hmm. But for my dad, um, Again, most of it wasn't too bad. I, I actually often would be frustrated with him, like, oh, gosh, dad, couldn't you have put in a paragraph break now and then? Or couldn't you have <laughs> told the story in order? Because I, I yeah. always felt like, okay, there's good stuff in here. There's really great. And yeah. I should explain the title, by the way, the uh, the crass, yeah. Yeah. now this ain't no shit. Uh, that's, yeah. that's from the introduction. He says, uh, a fairy tale, the difference between a fairy tale and a sea story is a fairy tale starts with once upon a time, but a sea story starts with, now this ain't no shit. Because in addition to this technical information about his helicopter and, and how he flew it and the emergency procedures and all that, he had some great rescue stories in there. He got the humanitarian service medal four times for saving people wow. from sinking ships in uh, the Straits of Florida and the Sea of China. Amazing, amazing. Um, so I had to like, I had to like excavate these complete stories from his sometimes, you know, wayward uh, storytelling style. Most of the book wasn't too hard to work on uh, grief wise because it was, he was telling the story of his career and it was all before I was born for the most part. I see. The part that became difficult was getting to the end and seeing like, oh, it just stops in the middle of a page. Yeah. Like this is yeah. literally how far he got. And then the next day he died. Um, yeah. And seeing that, like, he didn't, he, he finished about three quarters of his outline. 
he got right up to 1983, the year before I was born. And okay. there, was, there was more story to tell. His outline said, I want to talk about this and that from my career in San Diego. But uh, he just didn't get a chance. And so yeah. that part was hard. And I, I kind of had to, to edit some things around to make more of a natural ending to the book where he talks mm -hmm. about visiting his old training sites in uh, Pensacola to, okay. uh, he and I went on a road trip to visit, you know, where he trained. And so I, I brought that into the end as a kind of natural uh, conclusion. So oh, that's genius. that was that's hard, genius. but it, it also yeah. just working on the project was a great way to, to commune with him. I felt like I want to help you tell your story, dad. Yeah. yeah. Oh, what a cool feeling too. And how, how interesting that where, when he did stop the story, you felt comfortable to fill in those gaps because then it was around the time you were born, not that you remember the day you were born, but, um, at that point, it probably wasn't as a much of a challenge and, um, you didn't have to create as much additional content, right? You said you filled in the gaps a little bit so that it had a natural ending. Um, but primarily you were working with what you had. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, he had, it was, I mean, the book is still, 99% him. And then for the years that he wasn't able to fill in, uh, my mom, again, was very helpful in, in finding his, you know, his service records and, you know, where he was deployed for, for the rest of it. Okay. Okay. So now I want to get into the weeds. We okay. got to talk editor talk. Yes, please. I want to know, <laughs> this is the part where I think, uh, editors are very curious to know what your process was. How did you stay organized? How did you, um, go through the developmental process? Uh, I want details about everything, all the nerdy nitty gritty in the weeds details as much as you can share. Uh, because I would, I think it'll be so helpful for other editors to hear this. Well, I hope my experiences will be helpful because uh, I really just approached it like I, I tried to approach it like I would any other book. I, mm -hmm. I started working on these after I had been uh, freelance copy editing for many years. So, you know, I took the same approach of, all right, I've got a, I'm taking these images that he pasted in from Google and, and you know, keeping a record of where they were in the document so that I can take all those messy word artifacts out. Um, and then, you know, it, it was a pretty big organizational challenge uh, for my dad's book to, to find uh, public domain or creative commons images that I could use without you right. know, paying licensing fee. Um, luckily, because of the subject matter, uh, any, any photo taken by a service member in the course of their job is automatically public domain. So that helped. Um, that's awesome. And so how long did this take? A couple of years to do the whole thing? Like once you started to when you um, were you're ready to publish? Um, I think so. Grandpa's book took longer because it was a lot of transcribing uh, from his notes for his letters were all handwritten. So I had oh, to, you know, have the did that? paper open. Yeah. Oh, man, that's a lot of work. And a, fu a funny story about that is that um, he would leave blanks in his letters where he would use a swear word because he was writing to his mom and dad. <laughs> so he said, well, this, this service is a load of blank. And so I just left those in the book. He put a blank there. So that's hilarious. And that's his, that was his personality. That was his coming personality. Yeah. I think it really comes yeah. through. Uh, yeah. Oh uh, yeah. But, uh, grandpa's book took about 10 minutes, months, uh, between all the synthesizing of the, the rescue story and mm -hmm. the transcribing my dad's book. Once I really started focusing on it, uh, it, and like I said, it took a lot of work to like chew through all of his disorganized, mm -hmm. disorganized notes about six months. Cause I thought I, I oh, need wow. to, to really focus on this to get it done. I'm impressed. That's awesome. And you had no help, right? Or did you, did you have help from family to help you get organized or track photos or anything like that? No, just me. Just you. And did you, and you probably had your own system in place where I'm imagining figuring out where the photos would go in the book. Did you have like a, like a numbered system or something? Um, gosh, I have to remember what I actually did. Uh, I think it was just a separate document where I, you know, I made sure to keep notes on, okay, I saved this image from Wikipedia, Wikimedia Commons. Here's the 
the Creative Commons license, because if it's not public domain, you still have to cite, you know, Creative Commons license 2.0 requires attribution or, or not. There's different licenses that come with that. So you got to be careful. Mm-hmm. Um, just had a, a separate Word document open where I made sure to go, okay, this matches to here in the, in the manuscript and mm-hmm. pieced it back together again in uh, InDesign. So you had a methodical approach. It wasn't that you, you didn't, it sounds like, cause you were quick and fast. You didn't want to um, allow the project to become overwhelming. You wanted to get it done and you're highly motivated, which is very, very cool. Uh, so this is leading me into areas where projects do like that feeling of when things do become overwhelming. Did you ever have those moments? It sounds like you didn't, but if you did, if not just overwhelming, but What were, I guess, one of the major challenges and meaning, did you have moments of, I said overwhelm, but maybe self-doubt? Did you ever have those moments? You're like, am I even doing this right? I Because you want to do right by your family. Um, I feel like I I could totally see myself sitting there like, oh, this is all wrong, you know, and questioning myself. Did you have those moments of self-doubt or overwhelm when you were doing it? It took a long time just to start working on my dad's book. I initially wanted to do his before I worked on uh, grandpa's, but it was, it was partially when the grief was still too fresh, it was hard to get into it because it was also at the same time I was helping make sense of his other records, his other belongings and whatnot. Um, But also like, As opposed to grandpa's book where I had the letters, I had the primary source there to fall back on. With my dad's book, it's like, if I make changes, I know I want to keep the original to make sure I can reference what he originally said. Like, do I work with track changes on so that I can see in the document, okay, what have I changed? Where have I like tidied up the grammar or moved things around? And that proved to be too overwhelming because... okay. Um, it needed a lot of developmental editing to to bring up to a level where it would be it make for a, a good readable book as far right. as you know just straightening out the uh, outline of it mm-hmm. so I just had to and this comes to advice I would have for editors who are doing their own uh, posthumous editing projects right. is you just at some point you have to have confidence in yourself you have to have confidence in your own ability as an editor if you can't talk to the person who wrote this to answer questions or to ask their advice on how to edit it. And if you don't have another editor on the project, like if you're freelancing, Mm -hmm. you just have to go with your gut, go with your gut as a reader, as an editor, go with what uh, sounds right. And remember that it's, again, this depends on the project and the person, but it's, it's not about staying true to the, you know, the very, every individual word that they said, but telling their story. That's what matters. You want to get the details right, but you also want it to be something that people can, can uh, latch onto and become invested in. Did you seek any advice from an outside perspective outside of your family? Uh, any, any, uh, editors or anybody who you wanted to have like kind of read through, or did you have someone else do maybe a copy edit or something like that? Yes. Uh, for, for my grandpa's book, for we flew out and walked back. Uh, my dear friend and fellow editor Sylvia Zareva, she read the manuscript uh, before I started awesome. the book design, and I had a she had a great piece of advice, which was uh, there was an anecdote at the very end of the book where Grandpa says, "And oh, by the way, decades later during the Vietnam War, I happened to meet the person who shot my plane down <gasps> at a bar." No way. It, no way. Maybe it was a tall tale, but I believe it. And he, he had okay. this great anecdote of thing where he, he meets the, the woman in the German army who shot his plane down over Munich. Uh, and Sylvia said, wow. that has to be the first thing people read. That is just such an amazing oh. anecdote. Put that yeah. at the front and then back up to when he was 19 years old, just entering the service. And I was like, it's genius. Thank you, Sylvia. Yes. Like, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sylvia. <laughs> because then that also gets well, us excited. Like, oh, what was this? What was the story? How did he, how did he survive? Go. How did he make it back home? Yeah, there you go. I mean, that's, that's the power of editors. That's the, that's the editorial uh, perspective and uh, that outside perspective to get that hook, 
yeah. get that reader hooked. What the heck happened and how in the hell did that he meet the person? This I believe it too, but how it just seems it just doesn't seem possible. The same person that shot him down, he saw again. Yeah. Amazing. It's, it's such like a, a movie. It's such a like specific a detail that you think, how yeah. can that not have, have actually happened? <laughs> right, right. It's, I swear that's like a scene from a movie like that, that doesn't happen in real life. Um, but man, crazy. So, uh, I should have asked earlier, were, are, were both these self-published books or did they get picked up by a publisher? Yes. Uh, I have a, uh, I have a self-publisher, uh, Desert Owl Press. I formed it in order to, now I'm going to promote my, uh, my next project, which is my epic sci-fi illustrated novel, Phoenix Dawn, uh, the so cool. new color paperback edition is coming out. It's got 50 illustrations of the, the sci-fi adventure story. So look for that soon. Um, Amazing. I made the self-publisher for this book back when it was in hardcover. And then I just, I thought, you know what? It's so much easier. I have more control over the book design. Uh, why not? Uh, and so I've done uh, four books since then. I just want to reiterate that you did these illustrations. I want yeah. the listeners to know that is just the coolest thing I've ever heard. I wish I had an artistic ability. Yeah. If you're watching the podcast right now, he's holding up a page of uh, one of his illustrations. And what is that of? It looks like one of the characters. Yeah, this is this is the the hero of the uh, the, the adventure. This is Ran, and this is the Ran. villain, uh, the Emperor Mudera of the Sung Empire. <laughs> so, it's just a, oh, just man. an old fashioned just, space a... fantasy story. If you I enjoy that kind of that kind of pulp, I, and I really love details like that. He has the coolest thing with drop caps, where oh. he's created these illustrations of the letters. He was just showing that on the screen. Absolutely fabulous! So cool. You're like the jack of all trades. You're oh, an illustrator, you. editor, writer, um, and now a posthumous editor that you could add to your uh, list of skills, professional skills. So if you're in the San Diego area, you'll want to meet Dan someday. He'll probably be at some type of book fair in the future, signing copies of his illustrated sci-fi. Yeah, I hope so. I want a signed copy of that. Um, what a great interview. This is such a cool um, world or a cool avenue of editing that requires a specific developmental editorial approach. And I think it takes someone like Dan to be methodical, organized. Um, it's not easy. I know it wasn't easy. I can, I I'm already imagining myself in your shoes and how I would handle this. I think I would probably have emotional breakdowns. <laughs> I think I would get like easily frustrated. Uh, and until so I can't, uh, I mean, I feel like you should win an award for this <laughs> because of what you accomplished not once, but twice is huge. So um, it's been an honor having you and I can't thank you enough for this interview. Thank you. I, I, there's one point I want to make sure that I get across even if briefly, and that is in addition to if anyone else is working on a project like this, in addition to trusting in yourself, if you encounter uncertainty, also focus on the story that's being told. I think that if someone has passed away, there's a tendency to try to like, you know, gloss over their image and, and present them as... Mm as uh, something different than human, but that actually does a person a disservice. Like if parts of their story aren't so flattering, keep that in. It's part of their story. It parts, it's part of what makes them relatable. I wanted to make sure that I got that I'm advice so across too. I'm so glad you said that. I'm so glad you said that because it's honest um, and you're staying true to telling the story and not to glorify a figure because they've passed away, but to be honest about their story. That's yeah. so important. That's really great advice, Dan. Thank you so much. This was such a great, great conversation about posthumous editing. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Nadia. Thank you for listening to the Editor's Half Hour. This podcast is your go-to resource for editorial trends, opening the discussion for new ideas through the real-life stories of editors. For more information about Nadia Jaja Pupa and her business, visit peakpublishing.com. That's P-I-Q-U-E publishing.com. Be sure to follow Peak Publishing on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And remember to subscribe and follow The Editor's Half Hour wherever you get your podcasts.